and intention creates our life. Thought manifests or leads to deeds, and deeds develop into habit, and habit hardens into character, and character shapes our world. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Nearly the end of the retreat, Tomorrow is the last full day. We'll be sitting and walking until mid-afternoon, and then we'll work with some mindful speaking tomorrow afternoon. And so, in considering what to speak about, I thought it might be helpful to speak about a particular aspect of practice that can, in part, serve you not just while you continue to be on retreat, but as you return. And that is conscious intention, the intention of the heart. And I would speak about it since in the morning instructions we spoke about beginning to examine intention as a way of linking the universal aspects of the Dharma to the personal. The universal aspects, as we sit and walk, we see that all things change, that they're all impermanent, that they are unreliable, insubstantial, that's dukkha, and that they are selfless, that they can't be controlled or possessed or kept in any form, and that if we let go, we come to ease, balance, to peace. So we begin to see the universal aspects of life that we can't grasp and hold it. It's not ours to possess. It is always changing. And yet within this ever-changing flow, this universal truth, the river of experience, there is also the mystery of our individual life, and that we could call the personal. And within the personal which is made up of the patterns that continue to repeat in our life. There are, in Buddhist psychology, talked about unskillful patterns, grasping, aversion, the body of fear, that small sense of self that operates and creates suffering. And there are the patterns of freedom, of wisdom, of love, of generosity, of spaciousness. And in the midst of those patterns, there is a quality that's a neutral quality in the mind. Buddhist psychology calls jetana, which means the energy to do, the will to do, to act. And it can be directed, it shapes our lives, depending where our energy goes. So, for example, a stranger walked from the high road toward the gates of a great city. By the side of the road sat an old wise woman who hailed the traveler, Welcome. What kind of people are they who live here? The traveler asked. How did you find them in the home city you left? Asked the wise woman. Oh, they were gossips, mean-spirited, often selfish, he stated, difficult to get along with. Ah, you'll find the people of the city to be likewise. Later, a second stranger passed by and was welcomed by the old woman. What kind of people are they who live here? The traveler asked. How did you find them in the home city you left? Asked the wise woman. Oh, they were fine people, industrious, usually helpful, open-minded, and easy to get along with. You'll find this city to be likewise, she said. The patterns that mind creates determine the experience of our life. 
The very first verse in the Dhammapada, in the most popular common sayings of the Buddha in the sutras, begins that mind is the forerunner of all things. All is mind made with our mind and thoughts. We create our world. Speak or act with an impure mind, and trouble will follow you as surely as the wheel follows the ox that draws the cart. Mind is the forerunner of all things, all is mind made. Speak or act with a pure mind or heart, and happiness will follow you as your shadow unshakable. The first verse of the Dhammapada. Or Rabindranath Tagore, who put it this way. We imagine that our mind is a mirror, that it is more or less accurately reflecting what is happening outside us. On the contrary, our mind itself is the principal element of creation. Think about that. Our mind itself is the principal element of creation. If we look directly at the power of mind to envision and create or destroy, it's fantastic. You go to a city and here's the lights and the bridges and the buildings and the people and the cars and everything sparkling, this incredible thing, Boston, Manhattan. It's made of ideas first. I mean, even if you allow the physical reality of it, which is there in a tentative way. It was someone's imagination. Let's put a big one there with a kind of spire and slope top over on that one. And how about if we put a bridge there? We envision and we do, and there it comes. The whole shebang from imagination. And civilizations which rise and fall. Hundreds of civilizations. Remember the British Empire? In your very lifetime, great empires, or the Russian Soviet empire, huge empires, and then imagined existing and then change and disappear. But it's also small and individual, depending how we imagine and vision, that pattern begins to shape the experiences that come. From Annie Dillard, I read about an Eskimo, an old hunter, who asked the local missionary priest, if I did not know about God in sin, would I go to hell? No, said the priest, not if you weren't taught and didn't know. Then why, asked the Eskimo earnestly, why did you tell me? We started by examining small intention in our practice, those about to moments, sensing that before we get up, there's the motivation to stand, to get a drink or walk or move our body. Before we reach for a door, there's the motivation to go into that room, to stretch the arm, those little about to moments with our awareness. And as we do, we begin to see the relationship back and forth between not mind and body, body and mind, nama rupa, it's called. Begin to see there's physical elements and mental elements. Intention comes and then the body follows. What I'm speaking about tonight is a deeper level of this intention that plays between mind and body. The intentions that create the repeated and deep patterns of experience, the conscious directions that make up the pattern of our life. It's intentions and what we dedicate ourselves to, the kind of ardor that Eugene spoke of, what we care about. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, there's a great deal of talk about intention. It's said that a long, long time ago, when you were much younger than you are now, Before this Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, of 2,500 years ago, there was a Buddha named Dipankara Buddha, who had tremendous Mm -hmm. dignity and graciousness and ease and a field of awakening 
And as he came through the forests of India, visiting one community and one kingdom after another, he came to a place who heard a Buddha is coming. And all the people decided to make the path into their village and town beautiful. And they swept and they made it beautiful. One person whose job it was to do this got there kind of late and wasn't able to make it completely beautiful. There was still some mud there. And then he saw this man, Dipankara Buddha, walking down this path to the village and was so inspired by the presence of this being that he said, well, I didn't make it straight myself, so I will lay myself down across the mud and he can step on my cloak and my body in that way. It will be fine for him. And as the Buddha walked along and placed his foot on the cloak of this man lying there, the man said, this is such a magnificent thing to become a Buddha. I vow, however long it takes, that I too shall do what it, what is required to become a Buddha, like this one. And as the Pankara Buddha took his step, he nodded and said yes, and walked on. And that story is told about Siddhartha Gautama. That was a hundred thousand Mahakalpas before. And then to fulfill that vow, it took a hundred thousand Mahakalpas and four immensities of patience and perseverance and compassion and truthfulness and dedication and virtue and loving kindness over and over. And a Mahakalpa, remember, if there's a mountain, one Yojana high, as high as Mount Everest, distance an ox cart goes in one day seven miles high, seven miles wide, seven miles long, and a bird comes with a silk scarf in its beak and drags the scarf along the edge of that mountain, wearing it away. Every hundred years this bird comes to wear it down. When that huge mountain is worn down by the silk scarf, that's one Mahakalpa. <laughs> so we're talking patience <laughs> and truthfulness and compassion over and over not just to know the possibility of being a Buddha, but to ripen and completely fulfill it. That's the story. Now, traditionally, Buddhist stories are filled with this quality of directed intention. And one would often start a session of practice by taking a vow of wanting to bring benefit to other beings or to share the merit of this with all other beings, or to awaken, to set our intention for practice. And our society has a very good understanding of the power of intention. Rodney talked about it in his wanting view talk. Because what is advertising, commercialism, consumerism, all those things, but trying to create an imagination and an intention, isn't it? Have this and you'll be really happy. Buy this toaster, and you'll get this beautiful woman that's holding it with the toaster, you know, and all your sexual fantasies will be fulfilled by buying this product. I mean, it's trying to set a certain intention, and it does it over and over and spends billions of dollars doing it. What are the intentions? What did you have in school today, a father asked his teenage son. Oh, we had lectures on sex, was the reply. This story is dedicated to Eugene, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> lectures on sex? What did they tell you, asked the father. Well, first there was a priest who told us why we shouldn't. Then a doctor told us how we shouldn't. And finally the principal gave us a talk on where we shouldn't. <laughs> So there are the great intentions, and then there are the daily ones that get fed into us. Even children know the power of the heart of intention. There is a story. Yeah, I'll tell it. Why not? Long time ago again, in those hundred thousand Mahakalpas of lifetimes, when you were much younger, the Buddha was born as a parrot. 
a beautiful colored bird in this forest, and a friendly bird who took fruit from the trees and talked to the squirrels and the deer and the tigers and the mice and all of those creatures. And as it happened, one day in the dry season there came thunder and lightning but no rain, and a forest fire was started. And this huge fire began to spread through the forest, and the parrot who could fly away but had a good heart, became terribly concerned for all her friends. The mice were running as fast as they could, but they only had legs that big. And the fire was moving fast in the wind. And the badgers were digging underground in the moles, and she was worried about them. And the rabbits were hopping, but not very fast. What can I do, she thought. What can I do, as the story is told? So she flew over to the nearby river and dove herself into the water and flew back through the flames and the smoke and dove down into the floor of the forest to find a little mouse that she knew or a rabbit and shake some water on it to cool it as it ran. And then she'd fly through the flames again and she was getting sooty and dirty and out of breath and dive in the river back and forth and do that. And as she did this back and forth as best as she could while the fire spread and the animals ran in terror. It turned out that the seat of Saka, the king of the gods in heaven, began to get hot, which happens in these stories when something unusual occurs down on earth. So the king of the gods, who was playing with the other gods and goddesses in great pleasure, looked down, the seat got hot and said, what's happening down there to warm me up? and saw the forest fire, and saw this little parrot going back and forth through the flames and the smoke, bringing the few drops of water it could. It's kind of amazed. And the other god said, isn't that a foolish act? I mean, to think you can put out a forest fire by your own little feathers one at a time. But somehow the king of the gods, who had become king of the gods through great goodness, looked down and his heart was touched by her. And as he looked further over from heaven, he found himself turning upside down and falling. And when he looked up again, his wings had spread out and he had turned into a great eagle. He flew all the way down to the forest and began to fly alongside the parrot. What are you doing? He said to the parrot. She said, I'm trying to help, you know, help me. She went under the water, got some more water and so forth. Saka came flying along. But why are you doing this? I mean, it's a huge fire and you're only a small bird. Flying along. You know, this isn't really the time for questions. <laughs> Help me. Sprinkles a little animal through the flames, gets wet again. Yeah, but don't you understand that this little bit can't do anything in this great fire? She looked at him and she said, you know... Uh, she said, I do, we just have to do what we can. Each one of us is given something, and we have to do what we can. But please, you know, try and be of some help. I mean, this is, we can't discuss this now, you know. <laughs> and she kept going, and he watched her, and he felt deeply touched by her dedication. He just watched her doing this. He couldn't amaze. Amaze, she almost died doing it. And he felt so touched as he watched the animals scurrying and her dropping the water that he began to weep. And as the tears came down the eyes of this eagle, you know what happens when the king of the gods weeps, don't you? All of a sudden, the heavens broke open. And uh, this great rainstorm came down to the forest. And she who looked at him and said, you know, I don't really need advice, I need help. Now looked at him again, you know, and he began to resume from the eagle his great form and return to the heavens. And she landed and the forest was cooling from the rains. And all the animals came out and gathered round her and said, what an amazing thing to have a friend like you. So that's the story that's told to children in Asia, like you in the monastery. And then someone says, well, that's a nice story. And it's a beautiful story. But 
It's not really possible, is it? I never look at the masses as my responsibility, says Mother Teresa. I look at the individual. I can love only one person at a time. I can feed only one person at a time. Just one. 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 So you begin. I begin. I picked up one person. Maybe if I didn't pick up that one person, I wouldn't have picked up 42,000. The whole work is only a drop in the ocean, but if I didn't put the drop in, the ocean would be one drop less. Same thing for you. Same thing in your family, in the church where you go. Just begin. One, one, one. Buddha's whole life was based on the power of this intention, this vow, all these lifetimes, as the story is told. And then he came out of his father's palace where he was protected, you know the story, and saw the four heavenly messengers that reminded him of his vow. A sick person, remember, talked about, an old person, and a corpse. Those were the first three. And you remember what the fourth one was, anybody? A yogi, a monk, and a ascetic. And he saw that and he said, oh, yeah, I remember my vow. Right? I'm going to save all beings. When Ajahn Sumedho, my dear friend and Dharma brother and mentor, was first in England when Ajahn Chah brought him to the West, or he brought Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Chah came here in England and left Sumedho and another monk to start a monastery in London. But all they had was this little apartment. And they would go out, Ajahn Chah was with him every day for alms round, because Ajahn Chah said so. He thought, that's silly, you know, sidewalks, barefoot, begging bowl, monks in London. But Ajahn Chah said, it's your job as a monk, and you can gradually educate people about giving you food, and maybe it will take a year, or five years, or 50, or 500, but it doesn't matter. Sooner or later, they'll get the point. (laughs) So he would go out every day with his bowl, and no one would put food in particularly. But one day he was walking through a park nearby, and this man running by stopped and said, what are you? He said, I'm a forest monk, but actually I'm living here in London because we got given a little flat over there, and we're kind of living in that, and talked a little bit. And the man said, oh, that's so interesting. You see, I have a beautiful forest down Hammerwood in Kent, which is like the most beautiful It's like Westchester outside of New York, the most beautiful part of England. This whole big forest, and I've wondered what to do with it. Do you think you monks could take care of it? Sumedho said, that's what we do. We take care of the forest. And so he said, could I put it in your bowl? Wrote a little note, I hereby offer one forest. (laughs) Not the end of the story. That was where the monastery came from. So Ajahn Sumedho went back, talked with Ajahn Chah, said, is that why we go out, you know, to teach people and to receive alms? Ajahn Chah said, that's not the real reason. That's just a part of it. The real reason you go out every morning is because you are one of the four heavenly messengers. And so out there on the streets, someday is a Buddha. And they are waiting to see you and be reminded of this possibility. And that's why you have to go out every day. In the monastery training, we would start each day with intention. We'd get up at 3.30 in the morning, bong, bong, be the sound of the bells in the midst of the forest. Too early for my mind, but there it was. And we'd come together and chant and then spend some time walking at night in the solitude and then come together. But the early chanting was praise to the Buddha and to seeing the Buddha in all beings, praise to the Dharma. It's the thing I chanted a couple of nights here. Praise to the truth that's open-handed, available to all, free, awakening to those who take up the, the banner of the truth. Praise to the Sangha. And then we would dedicate our day. May I realize this Buddha nature, this Dharma. And then we would chant hair, teeth, nails, skin, um, lungs, heart, blood, urine, feces, phlegm, stomach, all the parts of the body, and chant, who am I really? Am I this physical body? That would be the question. Or could I awaken beyond that? We don't possess it. Then we do a chant 
reminding ourselves of old age and sickness and death. What do we possess? And then we would do a chant of intention, of compassion, of freedom. I dedicate this day to freedom. It was a beautiful way to live. And then we'd take our bowls after some more sitting and walking and go out for alms food, one of the most lovely experiences of my whole life, to walk across the rice paddies early in the morning in those little dikes, come to a silent village barefoot, People waiting with their food with their hands like this and offer their food. Sometimes very poor people would give food to us Westerners who have so much more wealth. Even if you were a poor hippie, you could still, you know, write home and say, I'm in trouble. Send me $500 for the hospital. These people, that was like 10 years income. Impossible. Here I was taking their food and you can't say thank you. You know, thanks for that mango or that fish curry. You, you just walk and you receive the food. With they, they give it with such beauty. And you make an intention. May I receive this food and use it for a value for myself and all beings. Because that's how it's offered. We so value spiritual awakening that we'll give of the little we have that some of us in this society can continue to represent that awakening. Very tender. Strawberries are too delicate to be picked by machine. The perfectly ripe ones bruise even at too heavy a human touch. Every strawberry you've ever eaten, every piece of fruit, has been picked by callous human hands. Every piece of bread, every glass of wine, represents someone's knees, someone's aching backs and hips, someone with a bandana on her wrist to wipe away the sweat. We cannot get away from the truth. The only way we can live is to feed one another. And you felt that as it came into your bowl, this dedication. So what you do is you start each day with this intention. And intention creates our life. Thought manifests or leads to deeds, and deeds develop into habit, and habit hardens into character, and character shapes our world. So watch the ways of thought, the seeds of thought, and care for it, and see that the thoughts spring out of love for all beings. We sit to come to the core of what our intention might be. And I remember sitting with my father as he died, And he died a few years ago. I loved him very dearly. He was a very difficult person. And he was angry and frightened. And lying there in the ICU, he was a paranoid person looking over at the monitors all the time. Am I going to die and no one will know it? Because he was a scientist and he taught in medical school. He developed a lot of those machines. I said, what's going to happen when you die? Nothing. Go back to zero. Well, maybe. Maybe something else will happen. You know, the majority of people in the world don't think that way. I myself have had experiences of out of the body and light. And I told him all this stuff. I said, it could happen to you, you know. He said, nah, not likely. I said, it might. And remember, if it does, I told you so. <laughs> but he's lying there and he's terrified, you know. And I tried to teach him meditation. Impossible. 15 minutes meditation instruction after 75 years of practicing paranoia does not work. (laughs) Tried to teach him metta, even that didn't work. All he wanted got late at night, don't go, just stay, hold my hand, hold your hand in our family. Just be here, I'm so afraid. That's all he wanted, someone to be with him and not leave him alone. People shouldn't have to die alone. I mean, he was right. But more than that, As Kubler Ross says, we die in character, and the patterns that we practice are the ways that we live and the way that we die. And don't think that death is such an easy thing. You know, I could read you the texts and the descriptions of earth, of the pallor sitting in and the body falling back, and the sense of, you know, ourselves losing control of our body, and the fires, this great heat, we feel like we're in this huge 
um, blazing storm and the heat runs out of our body and we're cold and we're shivering and our breath doesn't work anymore and the water, like we're drowning, all the elements of the body, water returns to water and earth returns to earth and fire returns to fire. Very powerful forces. What patterns do we make? You know there is a story of Ishii. Remember who Ishii was? Ishii in two worlds, the last of that Indian tribe in California. Beautiful stories. Well, as he told all about his life to the Krogers, the anthropologists that befriended him, in the end, when it came just time for Ishii to die, he said, there's one thing I never told you because I was not allowed to. And that is the song that is sung among our people to sing us to the other land, to the pure land, to the happy land after death, to our tribe. And I was never allowed to tell that or sing that for anyone. That is our secret song. But since there are no more of us left, I must break that vow and teach you that song so that you can sing me back to my people. What songs do we sing to guide our life? That is the question. This practice of attention is learning to bring ourselves fully, body, heart, mind, our whole being, into life so that we can live fully and die fully. And this is what the Buddha found when he set that intention the night of enlightenment. After all the practice and support was conditions had come together, the intention, I won't get up from this seat until I have seen so deeply into the nature of life, of birth and death, that I discover that freedom that I know can be found. What an intention. I won't get up until I find that freedom. Mm. What I've seen is that you can't do it just once. When you awaken, as the Buddha did, you discover that freedom that was always there, that is your birthright. Your true nature is freedom. It is, it is. But then you forget it. Isn't that amazing? You've had moments of freedom in this retreat. Many of you have. That's why they say today's satori is tomorrow's mistake. You can't hold on to the enlightenment of today. It has to be one enlightened moment, one awakening after another. And the intention is not to get something, but to live each moment fully. Now, this power of intention is also found within the formal deep practice of certain meditations. It's called aditana there. And it means in some practices that as one sits and walks and gets quite still and concentrated and finds the presence to bow to grief and sorrow and joy and all those things until you find a real place of centeredness and very still, Then there are intentions or aditanas that you can make. May I be filled with rapture, and the rapture comes. Or may my mind go to the deepest place of peace it's capable of, and it does so. You can actually turn, the mind becomes malleable as a yogi in very deep places of concentration. May I re-experience the deepest understanding that has come to me, and it will arise when the mind becomes really unified and focused, just to let you know this sometimes. Quite fantastic. So this power of aditana, of intention, is a very great force. However, it is also important to understand its limits. There is a sutra where the Buddha speaks to someone who says, the mind can do anything, and therefore I will be able to do anything. 
the Buddha shakes his head. This person says, I won't grow old. I won't get sick. I won't die. You know, or you could try here. I will sit without thinking. You know, or this will come or that will come. And the Buddha shook his head and he said, such things would be like a man coming along with a basket and a hoe and starting to dig all the earth that he could and put it in the basket and put it elsewhere and saying, I'm going to dig up all of this earth, this great earth. Or a person coming with a bucket to the great Ganges River and taking out a bucket and then another and saying, I'm going to empty this great river. Would they be able to do so, my friend? Impossible, said this man. And in such a way, too, one cannot say there will not be old age or sickness or death. One cannot control that which is uncontrollable. So then what is possible? An apple seed won't turn into a mango. Won't. What is possible is that an apple seed can be brought into fruit, that we can plant it and water it and fertilize it and give it all the proper conditions. And then the beauty of that apple, its true nature, its Buddha nature, will manifest. That's what's possible. To harmonize our intention with the truth of this world. And what's possible for us as a human being is not to become a mango or an apple, but to become the most beautiful human being that we can, each in our own way. Not to be a sunflower or a columbine if we're a rose, but to be the rose. I'm an artist. When my daughter was born after a difficult labor, it was an emergency cesarean section. We were very worried. I was there at the hospital. I remember talking with the doctor about what I did for a living. And the doctor confided in me and said, I wish I had been a museum because I love to play concert piano. Later, after my wife had the delivery, the doctor came out with the good news that my wife was fine and I had a brand new healthy baby girl. While we were standing there and I was receiving the good news, another doctor walked up to that physician who had just completed the emergency cesarean section and delivered the child and said, excuse me, doctor, I just want to tell you that you performed brilliantly in there and it was an honor to assist you. I turned to the doctor and said, now tell the truth. You just brought a new life into the world, saved another life, and you've had one of your colleagues tell you it's an honor to be in your presence. For heaven's sake, can you honestly say you wish you had been a musician? The doctor grinned, nodded his head, and said, it went pretty well in there, I know. We both laughed, and then the doctor said, I know exactly why, too, because this morning I got up early, and for one hour I played Chopin at my piano. So what we're asking in looking at this power of intention is not to be something that we aren't, but to be fully what we can be. Sometimes it's talked about as these great vows. One begins sitting in Zen centers or in Mahayana tradition and takes the four great vows. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to awaken them all. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them all, and so forth. But does that mean that I, you know, moi, as Miss Piggy would say, <laughs> this one is going to enlighten all these beings? This is from Hui Nung, one of the great Zen masters. He says, first he goes through all those vows, and, uh, where are we? You know, I vow to deliver sentient beings everywhere and master all the dharmas. Learning and learned audience, now that we have vowed to deliver an infinite number of beings, what does this mean? Does it mean that I, Hui Nang, am going to go out and deliver them? And who are these sentient beings? But beings within our own mind. They are the delusive mind. 
the deceitful mind, the ignorant mind, and such like ones, all these are the sentient beings of experience, and each of them must be delivered by means of its own essence of mind. So it's not that we become kind of, you know, super Buddha or something going around doing this, but rather it's that we awaken together. Because as we go deeper and deeper into this mystery that Eugene spoke of, we find that we are not separate. That when we have a moment of awakening, it affects all other beings. And that we move from small self, the body of fear, to all together. In the monastery, we would again repeat our precepts regularly each day. Practices to not harm. We'd repeat our refuges. We'd do confessions, dedications, forgiveness over and over. You know why? Because it doesn't happen just once. I'll say it again. There is no enlightened retirement. Right? Wei Nung said again, speaking of Buddha nature, there is no difference between a sinner and a sage. One enlightened thought and one is a Buddha. And one foolish thought and one is again an ordinary man. Or woman, yes. What we can do is feel the possibility in any moment of awakening. And one of my friends who's in the this class of old students I've met with who practiced for 20 years. We're talking about how people practice. He said, my main practice is intention. I get up every morning and I make an intention <coughs> that this be a day of awakening and compassion. And I repeat it throughout the day. It's my practice. Like Gandhi, let my first act every morning be this resolve. I shall not fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only God. I shall not bear ill will toward anyone. I shall not submit to injustice. And I shall conquer untruth by truth. And in resisting untruth, I shall bear all suffering and bring blessings to all I touch. It's Gandhi's way of awakening. Kind of amazing, huh? It's not that we know where we're going, but it's setting a direction in this mystery. Here, a hospice story for you from my friend Franco in San Francisco. The day before his death, Patrick was in a waking coma. His face was full of tension, his head thrust back, the muscles in his throat were tight and constricted. Each breath was a struggle. Clearly, this was another stage of dying, but something seemed stuck. To me, a famous teacher with experience in these things told me his spirit was trying to leave his body and I should touch the top of his head to show the way. A physician told me to increase the morphine to relax his breathing. A body worker told me to hold certain pressure points on his feet to relieve the tension. I tried them all, but nothing changed. Instinctively, I just wanted to wrap myself around him. I climbed into bed, cradling Patrick in the curve of my arms. I remember rocking him back and forth as I began to swing, sing sweet lullabies to him. Not their nursery rhyme variety, but the kind you make up as you go along. Words and sounds mixing randomly, not making sense. Just love sounds, I call them. Every parent has done this for their sick or frightened child. As I sang softly in his ear, kissed his forehead, my hands knew what to do though there was no goal in mind. My fingers gently caressed his throat, stroked his face, open hands circling his heart. We lost all sense of time. I could feel him sink into me, my body cushioning what was left of his bony form. Eventually, his throat began to relax. His head came forward. His eyes opened. They looked relieved. I wondered... Then, afterward, if I had done the right thing, maybe I should have followed the teacher's advice. Had I pulled him back from some near-death state, stopped some process of release? I don't really know. I do know that the heart has to be soft before any of us can be free. 
Thank you. <laughs> A little punctuation there. This intention is not by clinging, but it's really a direction of the heart. St. John of the Cross said, if you wish to know the true path, close your eyes and feel your way in the dark. That's how it is. But within each thing, each moment, is the possibility of freedom. That was the moment of freedom. That was the possibility of freedom. Another possibility of freedom. I know somebody who works with prisoners in San Quentin. And he wrote about it, especially during the L.A. riots about five years ago, watching Rodney King. He said he got so inspired seeing Rodney King give a message of love to the world after he had been so beaten that he nearly died. And wrote to them and said, you know, my brothers and sisters, you who are living here in the most intense environment of separation and violence and alienation in the world, did you not see what Rodney King did? And does it not come to you that you too are living through something that will give you the inner authority to speak about love and reconciliation that no one on earth can deny to you? that the very difficult things you go through are the things that give you the authority to speak and know what true freedom is. It's like the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. Remember them? They got an award this year. Twenty years later, the mothers went to the plaza. They got this, you know, $100,000 humanitarian award. They went in front of the presidential palace to confront a bureaucracy of horror. They were fed up with feudal visits to chaplains who wore military boots under their robes. And the complaints office where the dictatorship received inquiries about the people it kidnapped, tortured, raped, and robbed and said nothing happened. When the women congregated there, the police snapped at them to keep moving, so the 14 mothers walk the plaza in slow circles. They kept coming back to protest, braving nightsticks, police dogs, and spies who infiltrated and killed three of their leaders. They say the mothers of the plaza were fearless as the eldest one who moves with slow dignity. But we were scared to death. We learned to walk with fear. To live with it, we had an obligation to find our children. And they walk still, Every Thursday, people go there and just to see this sight. They walk now for all the injustice in the world. We never found our children, but in that place we went to school. We told our stories. We cried together. It was our educational academy. The plaza saved us from the madhouse. At 325, the plaza would be as empty as a desert, And five minutes later, the mothers would appear like plants growing out of a subway station, the side streets. People would come and say, who are you, teachers, pensioners? It spread by word of mouth. And when our great poet Neruda heard about us in Paris, he said, the mothers are out. The military have already lost. We sit to discover this possibility of freedom in the midst of all things. And then as we leave here, we go out to practice this freedom, to follow the most beautiful intention of the heart. Close your eyes for a moment. You don't have to move just where you are. And take a moment to examine inside your own deepest intentions, the intentions by which you lead your life. Without judgment, with a tenderness and an honesty. Because some will come out of fear and security and comfort. There are others there too. Let yourself listen.
And as you listen, try to sense or feel or imagine what would be that intention that most deeply your heart longs for as a way to live in this human form on this earth. When we sit here and face our fear and our pain and our loneliness and grief and our love and hope and longing and our death which comes to us as we sit and our self, the small self and something beyond and bow to it all, we begin to find that place that can let go of all the things that limit our life. And then when we go out, we can then live from that unlimited place. Roberto de Vincenzo, a great athlete, an Argentine golfer, won one of his first tournaments, and after he got the check for winning it, smiled for the cameras, he went to the clubhouse and then out to the parking lot and was about to get in his car, and a woman approached him. She said, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. But you know, my child is so ill, seriously, near death. I don't know what I can do, how I could help her, pay the doctor bills. You know, can you help me? And he was so touched by her and the story. He took out a pen and he endorsed the day's winnings, gave her the whole check, put it in her hand, pressed it and said, make some good days for the baby. Next week, he was having lunch at another golf club. When a PGA official came up, said, you know, the boys in the parking lot, they told me uh, about this young woman you met, all that happened out there. He nodded, said, well, you know, I have news for you. She's a phony. She has no sick kid, no relationship, nothing. She's fleeced you, my friend. You mean, said Roberto, you mean there's no baby who's dying? That's right, said the official. Why, that's the best news I've heard all week, he answered. (laughs) There is an incredible freedom in every circumstance, every circumstance, and that is what we touch here. Now, there's a little danger in this talk that I have to say as I come to its conclusion. And that danger is that somehow we will confuse intention with will or effort, grasping. That is, that we'll place it in time, I'm not good, and by my intention I'm going to make myself a good person. Because none of us really think we're very good, if you look at it. Way down in there we're frightened and don't think so much of ourselves. The ego part, anyway, doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Only a few people nodded. Come on. (laughs) Fess up. (laughs) So we think somehow by our will and grasping we'll become something good. And it puts it in time as if our goodness were out there. And that's a mistake. That grasping, that will. At the heart's core, there is only one deep intention in this practice in the spiritual life. And that's the intention to awaken, to be free. May I be present for this life, open, which is the same as to love it. May I really be here to love this life as it is. Or another language for it, this sacred intention is, may I remember who I really am. Alan Watts' book, The Taboo Against, what is it called? on the taboo against remembering who we really are, on knowing who we really are, on the taboo against knowing who we really are. It's like that Hindu story that says, the child in the womb sings the song, may I remember who I really am, 
that's the song of the child in the womb. And then right after birth, the song changes and the child sings. Oh, I'm beginning to forget already. Pretending we sleep, we get entangled. Believing it, we get caught up in all these fears, the small sense of self. But there is within us what Ajahn Shah called the one who knows. And you know in a moment, you don't have to spend a long time remembering. In a moment we can remember. It is our true nature. It is natural as your breath to be free. And it is not far away. In the end, we are what we seek. That intention, the heart's longing to awaken to love, is who we are. And it's just letting go of the rest of that. Everyone knows that the drop merges into the ocean. Few remember that the ocean merges into the drop. We are what we seek. It's not out there and we become that. That becomes us. That's what we already are. And when we live from that intention, there is this shift from the small sense of self to this universe that can hardly contain us. You know, such a beautiful way to live. I went to see Ram Dass a few times in this last year after his major stroke. He was in the hospital. I visited him and then at home. And um, in the hospital, uh, it wasn't clear that he'd be able to ever speak again. It was such a big stroke, left side. I brought him a picture of Ramana Maharshi, this beautiful silent sage from India. I thought, I know Ramdas loved him. And in fact, right before his stroke, Ramdas had done a movie about Ramana. And I thought, well, this will be an inspiration. Maybe if he can't speak, he can still look at people with the eyes of the beloved. So I called Ramdas, you know, some months later after he got out of the hospital, said, I want to come visit you now. I knew he'd been in a lot of physical therapy and stuff. And he speaks slowly. He said, oh, Jack, yeah, I wanted to thank you for uh, bringing... uh, the picture, she's groping for words of Ramana Maharshi, very slow, to the hospital, and I, I have something to give you. And I said, yes. And he said, I want to give you a, a picture of my, uh, my, my, my guru, um, um, Neem Karoli Baba, he almost couldn't remember his name. I'm listening, that's kind of nice. He said, it's like... Uh, like baseball cards. <laughs> I'll give you one named Karoli Baba and a Mickey Mantle for Ramana Maharshi and two Ananda Mayamas and a Ted Williams. And in that moment, I knew that Ramdas was all right. You know? And I went to see him and he said, you know, I can't do much anymore here. I, I can't do much with my body. I can't even speak much. He said, but I try to have a moment of truth with each person that I see. What an intention to live one's life by. And if you go in India to the place where Gandhi was cremated along the banks of the Ganges outside of Delhi, there's this great huge lawn and some stone walls that are carved with some of his words. It's a great big lawn going way down to the Ghats to the river. And carved across the biggest part of Gandhi's tomb is a very simple phrase from Gandhi where he says, before you act, think of the poorest person that you have met and ask yourself, if this act will be of any benefit to them. That was how he lived his life. In all this, you can hear the power of intention.
and the beauty of that intention that moves from the body of fear to this greatness of heart that is who we really are. Let's sit for a moment. May you let the beauty of your life shine in this world. And may you find a way through this practice together we've done and many other things to let go of the fears, the confusion, the limitations that you believe and get caught in. To let go of all those things, the small self, that keep that true beauty from shining. 